And he wrote an article about it. The fact that uh, he brought up Bilderberg to her and how she had helped keep the UK out of the European Union and that she said that she was very, very proud of that and that she was most proud of that uh, and that basically it was treasonous. Well, the UK was sucked into the EU by the so-called trade deal, just like the TPP. And it, details were kept secret. They weren't allowed to vote on it. Just as we're now seeing their prime minister, our president, was, quote, given the unconstitutional authority under either country's laws to sign on to it. And now we know because of a, a statement President Obama made on NPR, that's on Infowars.com and DrudgeReport.com today, that indeed there is carbon taxes, there is, quote, global warming initiatives in the TPP agreement. There is draconian uh, manipulation of our borders, uh, quotas on refugees. It's the same thing that's in the EU or the NAU. It's the same group. And we're very honored to have Lord Christopher Monckton, who was on record uh, a major newspaper editor, inventor, uh, chief advisor uh, to Margaret Thatcher, the founder of UKIP, the fastest growing party in the UK and in Europe. Of course, their big stars, Nigel Farage, been a guest many times here. He heads up science and public policy.org. We normally have him on as the leading expert exposing Al Gore and the carbon tax fraud. And there's new documents out today that NASA was ordered to fix uh, the decline in temperature just as East Anglia got caught in Climate Gate doing. But we're not going to get into that today. I wanted to get Lord Moncton on, and I appreciate him taking the time out to do it on this Friday evening UK time to discuss what it's like to have fought this, held it back as her advisor, he was the guy, to found UKIP decades ago to try to get them then out of the EU, the dictatorial EU that makes 80 plus percent of UK laws without a vote. And to now have the BBC News headline, Germany's Merkel open to EU treaty changes for UK to keep them in, AP, EU ways, unprecedented reform as Britain threatens to leave. The TPP, the EU, it's all heads of the same globalist multinational hydra. And sure, UKIP's forced the Tories to act like they're going to try to let the EU uh, you know, system uh, be forced to a vote. But it does show major progress, in my view. And, and just look at the progress of founding UKIP. In fact, Lord Monjan, give us some of the history. In fact, I'm going to give you the floor right now. Uh, until we go to break well, about eight, I'll, nine minutes. I mean, when did you found UKIP? Break it all down for folks and, and where we are today, because this is so historical, and it's got to feel really good for you to see this happening. Well, UKIP was founded actually not by me, but it was founded 22 years ago. And but you were one of the founders of UKIP, from what I've read online. It came quite late to the party, actually. Uh, it was founded by originally an academic called Alan Sked, who was concerned that we were no longer a democracy. Our democracy had been taken away by stealth, piece by piece. They had dismantled our democracy. Now it's getting on for 90% of all laws made for us are made not by people we elect, but they're made by people we don't elect. Uh, the commissars, as the Germans call them, uh, the people who meet behind closed doors, there are 30 of them, nobody knows really who they are. Sure, but I want to give you the floor, but just uh, just to get it clear, you were there early on with Thatcher fighting it, from my research, okay. and you were involved yes. in the main launch of UKIP being successful, because from what I've read in newspapers, you're, you, I mean, they say you and Nigel Farage are basically founders of it. I mean, I guess because you helped it become successful, they say that then. I mean, sir, certainly in Scotland, we, we've got it going. We've now got our first representation north of the border. I was leader of the party in Scotland when that happened. We are making waves right throughout Britain. We got an enormous percentage of the vote at the last general election, but didn't get more than one parliamentary seat because when you first begin a breakthrough of this kind, you don't get many seats, and then you build on that, and next time we'll get still more because... What's going to happen is there's going to be a bogus negotiation where Cameron and the other European members will get together. They'll work out a few token concessions so that Cameron can then say to the people, well, I recommend that they've given us enough. What they won't have given us 
is our democracy back. And until they do, UKIP won't be satisfied. What we want to see is a right of the parliaments of member states to vote down legislation proposed by the EU unless and until the elected European Parliament, which at the moment doesn't even have the power to bring forward a bill, not much of a parliament that then, is given proper democratic power. If it's not given enough power, then we would rather just leave. So uh, we've made huge advances in the European elections. We're now the largest party in Britain in the European Parliament. We've made very big advances also in the British elections. Uh, but we've now begun, rather surprisingly, to take votes almost as much from the Labour Party as from the Conservative Party. Because one of the things that Nigel has brilliantly done is to broaden the appeal of the party. So it's no longer just the intellectuals, the academics concerned about our democracy. It's ordinary working people who are now becoming concerned about our democracy. Well, that's democracy. very exciting, but I mean, as somebody involved since the Thatcher administration, can you yeah. go back to the fight then? I mean, she was successful holding it back then. Then they were able to ram it through by stealth because I'm comparing it to how they're trying to ram through the TPP the very same way. Absolutely. They could not get through what eventually became the Maastricht Treaty, which was the one where we finally gave our control of our laws away forever. They couldn't get that through while Margaret Thatcher was still in office. They had to get rid of her before they could do it. And it was the pro-European faction in the cabinet that plotted against her to bring her down so that they could drag us in ever deeper into this mess of anti-democracy. And we fought that for, you know, for as long as she was prime minister. They knew they couldn't get away with that. She was very willing to work with our European partners on matters of common advantage. But she was not willing to give away our democracy. And she stood very firm and very strong and very clear on this. And, of course, it was very popular with the people. She was re-elected three times with huge majorities precisely because... She had taken a tough line, a pro-British line, and a pro-democracy line, because in, in her day, the two things went together. Now, Cameron is not of the same stamp. He's very different. He is saying, well, you know, we want to stay in the European Union, and he will do whatever it takes to, to do it. It's not even clear that they will make sure that the referendum bill, which has to be passed before a referendum can be held on this question, will pass the, the House of Lords because... Sure, but I mean, he is at least engaging in this lip service because of UKIP pressure, correct? Absolutely. There's no doubt that had it not been for UKIP, he wouldn't even have made that promise before the last general election that this time he would give us a referendum. So it shows the issue is now becoming more and more uh, uh, popular. People are more and more aware of it. Uh, now on the front pages, there's, there's no, no longer can the establishment say this is something you can sweep, out, sweep under the carpet. No longer can they say this is just a few cranks. That's what they said of us but, you know, in the early So years. isn't that a devastating victory for sovereignty worldwide? I, th I think this is enormous. Because I think what's going to happen is that uh, people worldwide will realize you can do this. You can fight City Hall on these democratic issues, and you can win. And I want to end very briefly on one little point that you raised earlier about Tom Carl of the NOAA and fiddling the temperature data to try to pretend that there has been global warming over the last 18 years, six months, when the satellites show zero global warming over the last 18 years, six months. How has he done this? He's done it by fiddling the figures. And he fiddled them in a really clever way, but we've seen through it. Now, I've got a paper already up on the internet at whatsupwiththat.com, W-A-T-T-S, upwiththat.com, which explains that since the oceans below the surface, which he's talking about, are warming at only one-fifth of the rate he says the surface is warming at, and because the air immediately above the surface he's talking about is not warming at all, the conclusion is that he is simply making it up. His paper is, in fact, a breach of the laws of thermodynamics, which is how heat gets moved around. If you make a sandwich, like the barbecue you and I had when I came to visit you in Austin, Texas, and you put meat in the middle and bread either side, 
If the bread is colder than the meat, the meat will cool down. It will not stay hotter than the bread. And what he's trying to say is that the surface in the middle of this sandwich between the air above and the ocean below is hotter than both. It can't be. It's as simple as that. Incredible. We've got one more segment, and I do want to segue into this because it's all interconnected. We now know TPP that's secret. Basically, the Asian Union emerged with the EU and the American Union under the trilateral plan. We now know, Lord Moncton, as you know, uh, that it does have that in it. Just outrageous. Well, this is an enormous disgrace that the Obama is insisting as, as the price of American cooperation in this and any other international agreement that the countries with whom he does business have to kowtow to this climate monster uh, by shutting down their major industries. And already your coal industry is, is on its knees, already your utilities are on their knees, already your aluminium smelters are going overseas, your steelworks are going overseas, and paradoxically, therefore, emitting more CO2 because they operate under more inefficient overseas regimes than if they'd stayed at home. But he doesn't care. These were the people who used to be the big donors for the Republican Party, and this has nothing to do with the climate, but everything to do with Obama trying to destroy the funding of his political opponents. It is as straightforward as that. It's very typical. It's a mafia our, takeover. It's like Hitler, for five years before he rounded them up, wouldn't let Jews and others run their shops to first make them destitute before he actually grabbed them. You take people's power away before you kill them. That's exactly what he's been trying to do, and that's the significance of Tom Carl's paper today. After the break, I'll tell you a very funny story about me and Tom Carl in front of Congress. Sure, I actually Carl skip the break, Lord Moncton, to give you more time. Yeah, sure. Do you want to carry on now? Or yeah, go ahead. Break? I just skipped it. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Right, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, about 2009 this was, I've been invited by the Republicans to testify as their witness in front of Congress, opposite Tom Carl, who, of course, was the Democrats' witness. Now, Tom Carl is the head of the National Climatic Data Center, which is a subdivision of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and it, among other things, keeps a global temperature record. Now, I was explaining to Congress, and I showed them a chart, which demonstrated that for the eight previous years, there had actually been glo global cooling. Now, Representative Joe Barton of Texas, who was the Republican ranking member on the committee at that time, said to Tom Carl, he said, but you and other officials have been coming here for months telling us we've got global warming. Lord Munchen says there hasn't been any. In fact, it's been cooling for eight years. Uh, will you please explain why you never told us that? Or is Lord Moncton lying to us? So Tom Carl flannelled like mad and said, oh, well, he wouldn't have done the thing the same way as I had done it. So Joe Barton cut him off and said, you're both to go away and write letters to the committee explaining your facts. So all I did was to send a letter to the committee taking Tom Carl's own temperature data set, the NCDC temperature data set, and sure enough, for eight years, it showed global cooling. He had tried to mislead Congress. He's now trying to mislead the world again, this time by pretending that there hasn't been this very long pause in global warming, during which for the last 18 years and six months, according to the satellite data that came out just two days ago, there has been no global warming at all, notwithstanding record increases in CO2 concentration. So we've got the CO2 concentration going through the roof. In fact, it's now higher than it's been in 810,000 years. Absolutely, sir. But I mean, before you go any further, just as a political researcher, the yes. Club of Rome, all these inside robber baron globalists that are the opposite of free market corporations are at war with the free market segment. And quite frankly, taking it over, uh, we're in deep trouble. Uh, and, and, and so productivity is in deep trouble. They're in a consolidation period. We're being conquered, basically. But even if carbon dioxide was bad, even if it was warming us up, even if all these lies were true, we always have that debate on the science, which I know is important, and you've won that debate. They just keep stonewalling. And, and, and separately, how does paying gore and blood carbon trading in London or paying the Chicago mercantile that Obama is invested in uh, and that Soros is invested in and then an NM Rothschild, how does paying these billionaires billions and billions and trillions in the aggregate, how
how does that save the earth when you move a thousand coal plants from the U.S. to Mexico and China where they have no controls and they're totally dirty and ours are clean? How? Yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, it's all a fraud. It's all a scam. So I'm I think give you a ticket on that because uh, China uh, overtook the United States just 10 years ago as the world's largest emitter and in 10 years has become twice as large an emitter of CO2. Yes. United States. What does Obama do? He goes to his fellow communists last December in China and says, you can go on emitting as much CO2 as you like. I'm going to shut down the U.S. economy so you don't have to compete with it for natural resources. Unbelievable. Concern of the Chinese. And the Chinese have said, yeah, we're happy with that. Well, what's not to like? So what is happening here? You're quite right about these rich people who have clambered onto this climate bandwagon because this Alex, is the fastest transfer of wealth and power ever from poor people worldwide to rich people worldwide in human history. That's what it's really all about. And they about. package it as helping poor people. Yeah. Because as you've said, they don't care about poor people. They care about them if, they, if they're voters. Otherwise, they don't care about them at all. And even then, not much. They want to get rich. They have realized that by coming up with this ridiculous, increasingly, visibly ridiculous climate mantra, they can get shovelfuls of cash. That's why Tom Carl comes out with these dopey papers and, and puts all those falsehoods in front well, of Well, I mean, them. how many times can they get caught with fake data and fake data sets in the emails, you know, to hundreds of other groups faking everything? I mean, how many times can they get caught until they get into some type of trouble? I want you to answer that, policer. And then in closing... What about Al Gore in a speech, we played the clip last week, in 2007, getting his Nobel Prize, or 2006, saying that the Antarctic ice cap will be completely gone by 2013, and now it's at record levels. I mean, he's got to get caught saying polar bears are all dying when their numbers are up fivefold. That's right, the polar bears' numbers are up. It's the Arctic ice cap he was talking about, and that is still there, very much still there. The uh, you've got my piece now. I see on the on the. Well, was he uh, talking about? And uh, uh, he was talking about Arctic. Yeah, the northern. I, I said the southern. Sorry. The Arctic, yes. Uh, and the, the 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 Arctic ice uh, is still there, even in the summer. And it wouldn't matter terribly much if it disappeared in the summer. It's only going to disappear for a few weeks. Again, the laws of thermodynamics dictate that for the rest of the time, it's got to be there because of the way the sun uh, hits at an angle. So all of these fictions are beginning to become more and more implausible. That's the significance of Tom Carl's ludicrous paper, because what he is having to do is to produce so absurd a false result that even a layman like me can look at it and find the most obvious way of showing it's an absurd result, which is if the air above the surface isn't warming, if the ocean below the surface is hardly warming, how can the surface itself be warming? The answer is it can't. It's a, an offense against the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of how heat moves around in the system. There is no way that his result can be correct. It is really as simple as that, and that's the point. Are you saying yeah. 2 plus 2 doesn't really equal 5 like Common Core says? That's it. I'm saying 2 plus 2 still equals 4. Like it or not, Alex, I'm old-fashioned about these things. And what they are saying is they are now in desperation coming out with lies that are so absurd that you can knock them down in two minutes. It not even, doesn't even require detailed research to do it. And that's the point. They know this, that this Paris climate... So what are they going to do next, and what's their next big power grab? next big thing is the climate, the climate conference in Paris. The Paris Climate Conference is, is the real big one. That's in December this year. It's the 23rd, I think it is, in the series of annual UN climate bedwetters conferences where tens of thousands of activists basically go there and a few dozen national negotiators go there. And they now have in place a plan which will create what they're no longer going to call a global government. The, the term government was used in the 2009 Copenhagen draft, which failed when China blew it out of the water. But now China's been nobbled by Obama because he's exempted them from having to make any cuts in emissions. Whatever Paris actually does will make no difference to the climate, even if CO2 had an influence uh, to the degree that they say it does, which we now know it doesn't. But they're still going to set up their global government. They're calling it this time, rather coyly, a governing body so that they can easily change it into a government later. Exactly the same as the EU. It's the same model. 
They started by requiring that nations should report various data to them. They then gradually increased the obligations to report so that you're having to spend vast amounts of money collecting perfectly useless data about how much CO2 you emit and how much you scavenge back by planting trees. I mean, nonsensical stuff. And they make the nations do that. Then they make the nations comply with various targets, which the nations, first of all, voluntarily put forward, and then gradually they become compulsory. That's the stage they're reaching now in Paris. They have set up in the meantime something like a thousand new supranational bureaucracies to be the sinews of this global government. They are already in place. They were put in place by the Cancun Treaty. The well, Lord Monckton, after. we're going to have to have you back up in the near future to break all that down. Scienceandpublicpolicy.org. You're on the front line of fighting global tyranny, and we salute you for your great work with the UKIP and others on forcing an awakening to the fact that you're under EU dictatorship. Thank you so much. Great job. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much, and God bless you. God bless America. We will keep the world free, whether the powers that be like it or not. Hoorah to that. We'll be back. Tons of news straight ahead.